Our first speaker is Professor Ginny Salmon. Ginny is Professor of E-Learning and Learning Technologies at the University of Leicester, where she heads the Beyond Distance Research Alliance and the Media Zoo. Um, Ginny has written many books. She's written five books on e-learning, many of which will be on our bookshelves, including her latest one, Podcasting for Learning in Universities. Um, Ginny will also be co-chair of Alt-C 2009, and uh, I think there's some information tomorrow about that. Her talk today is, If Learning Technologists Ruled the World. So, over to you, Julie. Thank okay. you. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for the chance to talk to you, especially as I didn't have to put a paper in to do this. So, um, that was a big advantage for me, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> Okay, um, what I'm going to do is do a bit of intervention stuff, give you my view, perhaps, or some ideas of what might happen if learning technologies were ruling a number of different worlds. Um, and then I'm going to ask you to tell me what you would do if you were ruling the world. Okay, so that's what you're in for for the next 45 minutes. So those of you who are going to sleep, Okay, move to the back now um, so that your neighbours don't have to kick you when it comes to the discussion bits. Okay, yeah? Okay. Now, um, I, I believe that we are at the beginning not only of the greatest technological change in history, but the greatest change in learning and educational processes too. So... I know that some of you will agree with me, some others maybe not, but the rest of what I'm going to say is on the basis that, that those big, huge changes are about to happen. Now, when you look at what these changes might be, you look at the role of the historian and look at the trends that have been happening up until now, um, and also try and look into the future in various ways, um, not just to show the momentum of events, although those are important, not even just the possibilities at each juncture, but most importantly, the human ideas, the emotions and the visions, including the implications for society. And do you know, in all of this, it is so curious, uh, very rarely is the role of education at any level truly addressed either as the enabler or the constrainer of the future? Um, or is the issue of how we support the learning process itself and the impact that might have on the future also addressed? Now, each one of you here, every one of you I know, both individually and collectively in your various groupings, is able to explore future ideas, you're able to make choices between scientific principles. You're able to do imaginative innovation. You're able to combine ideas. You're able to extrapolate. Um, and yet, very few of us really know or really feel we know of what's going to be happening to us in three years, five years, ten years. So we know we're in a rapid change in society, and it is intimately bound up with the digitalization of all of life. I mean, obviously, broadband, smaller personal devices, you name it, we hear it in every presentation, the changes that are happening. Supercomputers, fiber optic networks, making data available in unimaginable ways only a few years ago. So I th I'm pretty certain you'll agree, and I don't need to rehearse, that the technology and its impact on almost every aspect of daily life comes continuously and fast. And every time there's a change in the technology, there comes the inevitable rethink in ideas, including perhaps about learning, knowledge, education, and so on. Now, traditional forms of education with their specialism, silo thinking, and the associated ways of transmitting knowledge have done almost nothing to prepare any of us 
for this huge abundance of information everywhere, everyone. And there is the known phenomenon, the arrogance of the presence, which is often associated with reductionist views, rife in education and continue to be powerful in our very competitive times. And they rarely accommodate the huge complexity in thinking that's actually needed to change the world of the future. So you might say, well, OK, very well, how on earth do we do this? It's something you're all trying to do really every day of your lives um, in working with learning technology. Well, first, you need to do something called capturing the spirit of the times. Um, and there's two ways of doing this. One way is when you look at an idea, you evaluate it as, as a with-the-grain approach. Um, as you know, a lot of your colleagues, particularly the educators, prefer to stay within existing patterns. Have you noticed that? And are concerned, perhaps, that they can reasonably ask learners to adopt a new approach or at least a new usage of a familiar device. And working with the grain can sometimes be a good thing because it's an incremental approach and over time it does result in change. But it can be also very restrictive. The most effective approaches are likely ap actually to be open to two perspectives, undercovering, un uncovering existing patterns and at times working with them, but at other times also seeking to enlarge their scope to enable more ambitious learning, something technologists are very good at. So that's one of the reasons why I particularly wanted a learning technologist to have a look at the what-ifs. You know, I know it's good to stay with incremental and stay with the patterns of what you can achieve, but you also need to be looking over the horizon, to thinking out of the box, as they say, and looking at what's coming a bit further up. And you could then be the hidden bridge between the past and the future for education. Now, there's lots of examples of small groups of thoughtful people who could change the world in Indeed, the great anthropologist Margaret Mead pointed out, in fact, it's the only way you change the world, by small groups of influential people. And I thought the uh, Paralympics would be one example of that. Think how all the views on that has changed, not the least in China, over a very small uh, period of time by a group of people who got together and made it happen. And this could be us. I don't suppose there was any more people who did that than sitting in this room now who really said, OK, we're going to do something different. Um, and also, some of you, some of the people who are slightly older like me, will remember the James Burke TV series. By the way, they're all on YouTube now, even though you can't buy them from the BBC. And they're absolutely great programs to watch yourself and also to use in your teaching. Um, and actually, this is the idea that each small change will make a difference. But you do need a vision. You do need a pathway. So each one of those changes will take you somewhere new. And also, this is something we've all thought about from time to time. But the change comes most by these just positions between various disciplines and even if you take your first discipline because most of you um, didn't decide to be a learning technologist I don't suppose when you were 16 or whatever you come from some other discipline to this point of time but between there and the technology and the education and all the pedagogical stuff it's actually at the interfaces at those boundaries that some of the most interesting things really are happening. So, that's what I'm on about. Are you still with me? Anyone want to go home? <laughs> um, I, th I started to think about what if we had more influence than we have so far? Okay, what if we really could start to change things in the way that many of us want to change them? 
So I've thought about just a few things against these three sectors. First of all, the university sector. Um, and I'm going to talk about that first of all. Now, of course, universities are very solid structures and, and they're based mainly on buildings, aren't they? You know, usually named over some benefactor or somebody who was a, a, a great innovator or if you have a handy one, a Nobel Prize winner. Um, and they have laboratories, which apparently have to be physical spaces, and they have lecture theatres, just like this one. Um, and this is a picture of where I work, and some of my colleagues who are in the audience down here give us a wave. And, <laughs> and um, when we called ourselves Beyond Distance, it was kind of a play on words about the research we were doing, but... The university took us very seriously, and our offices are on the top floor of this tower block. Um, so they put us well out of the way, so we didn't taint too much of the prettier buildings around us. Um, but of course, a lot of our work actually takes place now in quite different environments, such as this one. And this is the entrance to the Media Zoo on Second Life. So. That's the tradition that we're dealing with. So it's no wonder that it's pretty difficult to change that. Um, the buildings and the libraries and the labs and the museums and everything we work in are pretty solid structures around us, not easy to change. Um, I think this has been, for me, a, a, a very simple and influential model. And it's based on the idea of social entrepreneurship. Um, a lot of it, actually, um, is based really not so much on education, although if you look on the uh, Michael Young site, he was the guy who imagined the Open University, the Consumer Society, and lots of other things. It's worth a look. Um, but there's some very good publications coming out of the ideas of taking innovation into social enterprise for different purposes other than commercial gain. Um, and you'll see there's kind of three horizons that you can look at. So if you like the idea of doing a bit of what if um, when you leave this conference and go back to your own institutions and your own areas of work, you might like to have a look at this. And the first one is horizon one, is looking at what if you could actually use a new approach to extend and defend your core business. Okay. Uh, the second one is looking at uh, building a new and emerging business, actually going um, out on a limb and running and taking a few risks. And of course, there's another, and that's creating new and viable options rather than actually running with what's there, creating something new that somebody else hadn't thought of before. Now, I don't know what you think, but... Would you like to say where your institution is at the moment? I think might put Leicester there, somewhere around there. Horizon One. Anybody else? Is anybody at three? <laughs> I think most, you know, around this sort of area. And, of course, we should really all be having something over there in three. Um, and that's where your sort of what-if imagining can take you. Of course, you have to do a bit of both. Do you remember I said you need to go with the grain and you need the innovation? At Leicester, we actually focus on both existing students and stable technologies and we try and look at new technologies and new students and new technologies. So rather than having one e-learning strategy or one approach, you actually need different approaches to take account of the different kinds of innovation and the difference between the incremental and radical approaches that you can take. And you will find that on the left-hand side here, you're working with core technologies and developmental approaches. And possibly you can have targets that embrace everybody in the university. Whereas on the right-hand side, that's where your research comes from. That's where you can do small things. You can do pilot studies. And it's only at the point at which 
these sort of peripheral technologies, podcasting is an example, are ready to move across for everyone. They're stable enough pedagogical models from the research that you can then move across there. Does that make any sense to you? Okay, um, just like I say a few things, if you should want in your imagining to start to change anything here, before you can rule um, or indeed influence anything, you need first to seek to understand it. One worrying part of my networking to get ideas on this talk was the number of learning technologists who saw academics as the problem or thought that the organisation, the institution, should do something. For example, to improve communications. I think before you can rule or influence anyone or anything, you do need to stop hiding in your firewalls, sending insults or early salvos from entrenched positions yourself. So that's why I think some of the what-if imagining um, needs to start with ourselves, perhaps. There's no need to be shaping up for a war when what are needed are alliances, I think, of a new kind. I, of course, I'm not insensitive or untainted by this value set that the academics are the problem. I, I've been working in learning technologies for some 20 years now. But I do think that there has to be another way in the 21st century to avoid yet another long, cold and unproductive war. What I should tell you, though, that there is no grand master plan. The existing campaign maps are old and no longer describe the territories in which we will be travelling in the future. So it is up to each of us to take a fresh approach, to learn and share constantly across all the camps using the fantastic opportunities that we have, an unrivaled chance given to our generation and our generation of educators alone that no one has ever seen before. We also have very much better understanding of how to develop, what should I call it, wisdom, and action through experience. We know more about knowledge construction, quite simply. But we need now to apply these processes widely to learning and technology, to ourselves, in fact. So, well, let me have a look now at the world of formal education. Um, there's two quick bits from me on this, because... A lot of you will know more about this. Um, one about teachers and one about learners. Um, first, a lot of you know, and it was mentioned in my introduction, that I've, I've always been interested in the role of the teacher in online environments. And, of course, we moved, didn't we, from the sage on the stage to all together now? The guide on the side. And then where did we go next, do you think? Host on the post or something like that with asynchronous environments. Where do you think we're going next? Any suggestions? Well, here's some ideas. Okay. So there's no good thinking that if we've needed to, if we've managed to get teachers online that we've done it. Because obviously every time there's a new technology, they will claim that they need training and development again. This is why some of the research projects we're now doing at Beyond Distance, we're trying to look at some of the pedagogical models that we've developed in one environment and seeing to what extent they will work and transfer to another environment. Because then it's much quicker to get from the right-hand side of the experimentation, the small pilot studies, over to the mainstream, if we can do that, rather than starting all over again. I thought you might be interested in this. One of the people who did respond to my request out in various networks of, you know, if you, you know, if you're learning technologies ruled the world, what would you want? Came from Diana, 
Lorillard. And she was focusing almost entirely, as you can see here, on teacher education, which I thought was really interesting. She obviously feels that at this point in development, um, that, that teachers need to become partners with learning technologists. Um, and also she's, she's recognised that in order to scale up, they must become very much more independent, which is one of the reasons why also at Leicester we are trying to focus on low cost, high pedagogical value approaches, um, because that's the way we think a lot more teachers can get involved. Okay, and now there's learners themselves. Um, I actually think um, that what if learners really rose to the fore, you know? Is, is education the last social institution of the 21st century that does not consult its consumers? I mean, even as a patient in the National Health Service, you do get asked how you're doing. Um, you know, you are, there are panels and ways of getting involved in many ways. At the moment, yeah, there's bits of feedback, isn't there? I mean, mainly what it does is allows a bit of feedback at the end of three years of an undergraduate degree and then in a highly contested format. I know there's a problem. Innovation literature tells that ask any consumer what they want of a product that they've never used and you get very little help. That's always the case. We know that students entering higher education, for example, have very little idea of what to expect. Um, so if you ask them what technology will help with their learning when they get to university, they haven't got the slightest clue. Um, and that really doesn't take us anywhere very much. And of course, I also know that learners are not consumers choosing a washing machine, but neither are they mere users needing training in exploiting computers, nor are they any longer patients where the doctors cut out the ignorance. So learning technologies could define this new pathway to relationship between educators and educated. This is one project that we're just about to start um, at Leicester, which is going to have a go at this. Um, we've had a bit of a go of focus groups and so on. You don't get much from learners about the future in that because they know what they know. Um, but we're going to try some more creative approaches. So if any of you are interested in that, please stay in touch with us on that. We're going to produce lots of podcasts and lots of reports and, and try and engage as many people as possible with what we're doing. So... We do hope that you'll keep an eye on the, the CARF project. So I've put the URL up there. Um, Future Labs have also got, if you're interested in Learner Voice, some excellent publications. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's a bit of a start in that area. OK, um, just to say, not everybody likes this idea, do they? You know, this is quite a recent... Um, the idea of lunatics taking over the asylum. If you Google it, you get a whole range of stuff. You know, this is teachers complaining that they don't want students, pupils aged 10, on their interview panels. So, I mean, the world is changing a bit in those sorts of directions. OK, just one more intervention from me and the impact of learning and knowledge on society. Well, you know, there's a lot of talk, isn't there, about the big issues of the 21st century, despite dramatically better health, living conditions, and yes, education for much of the world, we still face huge challenges. Um, and the keynote yesterday, you saw you know, how he's trying to do a graphical representation of how that's going to go. Now, what if, what if education, informal, formal, conscious, unconscious, was actually able to get to grips with some of the big issues of our day. Why are we standing by and letting other people do this? I know you'll all have your own take on the answer to why. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things I, I thought about 
um, was this one. I don't know if you've seen this. It's quite an interesting page. Did I put the URL on it? Yes, it's there. The engineering challenges, but they're not just engineering. Um, they've got advanced personalised learning in their secure cyberspace. And, and these are really interesting pages to look at to explore the challenges. And of course, there's climate change and all the environmental issues as well. Um, the one at the bottom is um, the Millennium Goals for Health, Education, Entrepreneurship. Um, at, at Leicester, we're having a bit of a go with, with some of those, um, with one of our research projects. I, I th started to think about just supposing if every learning technologist blogged about how he or she could contribute to one of these. Just supposing that one outcome from the ALT conference, if not this year, then next year, was a learning technology blog which was addressing the big issues of the societies, the global society, 21st century. Just think how that would change the way people hear about the truth and reality. I mean, it's changed the delivery blogs, for instance, to take one example, have changed the way we think about media, how it's chosen, how it's structured, how it's presented by vested interests. In a, in a span of five years, blogs have invaded our culture and left what I think is an indelible mark across politics, marketing, journalism. And I think Clive's going to talk about content. I don't know whether he'll mention this, but it is reshaping our notion, would you agree, on how content is created and information is disseminated. Just supposing each of us, oh no, another thing to do, started a blog which actually tackled one of these big issues from the point of view of how learning and technology could contribute. What if is my question to you there. It would be such a great environment to read other people's ideas. Of course, we know the ideas may not always be fact-based. They may not always be insightful. They may not always be politically correct. But blogging does provide anyone with access to the web in a way to write about anything they want and potentially interact with a global audience. Now, this has not been possible in the past. As a minimum, blogging is making our society more transparent and causing an acceleration in the flattening of the world of knowledge. So what if blogging became the new deterrent, the new defence? I mean, deterring stopping disgraceful behaviour through speedy reporting to the global community. The time to get out through borders is no longer controlled or controllable. It could be a deterrent to malpractice, atrocity, ethnic cleansing, everything. Just what if, if we did something like this? So that's my challenge to you. I hope that each one of you is actually now going to invent the Greek alphabet and impact on demographic process or um, the printing press or the telegraph and impact on a new revolution of some kind in education and I hope that each one of you will report back uh, at next year's conference. Um, I want to go back to that actually. Um, I think I'm going to pass over to you now. Um, not only are we educating the generation that will need to solve the problems of the future but we should be enabling them to use the incredible power in their learning. Now, I'm going to ask you, what are your what-ifs against those three categories? And I'm going to ask you to talk to the person next to you in the great spirit of snowballing. I was trained to teach through the Open University, of course. Um, just a few minutes to talk to someone about these ideas, and then I'm going to ask you to give me some what-ifs, which we're going to record on my slides and on Illuminate for the rest of the world. So, a few minutes to talk, okay? Is that all right? Okay. Uh, ours was that as much information as possible would be available to as many people as possible. 
So, so it was that promotion? As much information. Oh, information. As possible, available to as many people as possible. The first keynote speaker who opened the conference talked about database hugging and we mm. thought an end to all that. In an accessible way. Semantic way, yeah. yeah, yeah, all of that. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. There's one there. One there, and can we get the cross there just to save a bit of time? The point I just wanted to make quickly is that uh, there's a view out there that the technologists love to look at screens and not at people. Uh, I think there's a key word, a rule. Uh, I think rulership is about where you look. Are you looking at the screen or you're looking at the crowd? There, perhaps there's a need to change both orientation and also power structures. Got it, okay. <laughs> what if our academics were expected to be creative in the way they approach their students? Got it. Okay. Any idea what you put in place? Remove the solid bits. Okay. Got it? Yeah. Anyone else? I wonder if we could do without intellectual property rights and the idea of owning information, being right, a single point of view, a curriculum, and everything that's linked to that. Okay. Yeah. Someone else? Anyone over here? What if um, excellence in teaching was rewarded? <laughs> Got it, Anna, any more? There was one here. It, oh, hello. I think more about play and the idea of actually getting people to understand their own uh, knowledge construction and getting people to play more because there's a lot of things to do with testing at the moment. It's about to uh, you know, creating or be creative about the world themselves and putting it back out there for other people to be creative with. I think that needs to be yeah, sort of changed. Yeah. yeah. I hope you're all going to do this. There's one over here. What if uh, universities and schools weren't forced to be so protective of their interests as business units and were therefore able to share resources better? Yeah. Okay, there's a couple here. What if there was no assignments? Okay. Got it. One up there. Um, what if uh, educational establishments had to uh, innovate? <laughs> I did say, if you, if you want to rule, you have to know how you're going to make it happen, yeah. <laughs> There's that one over um, here, thank you. Yeah, um, what if teachers really learnt to let go and let the learners direct the learning experience? Sorry, really learnt to? Um, direct the learning Direct the learning, the learning experience, yeah. Okay, okay any more? There's one up the top there. Anyone over here? Uh, hang on, just wait because it's not recorded. I will come to you next. Yeah. What if education was free at the point of um, need? Okay. And that can go behind you now. And there was one here, was there? Can you pass that one up there, please? Oh, sorry, you've got... Go on, go on. No, go on. Um, what if we're not reaching those we want to reach? Or what if they do not want to access it? Anymore over this side. What if universities thought that students were the most valuable thing 
and realise they don't own them. I didn't get the last bit. Uh, and also realise that they don't own the students. Don't own the students. Oh, wash your mouth out. OK, can you take another two? Any more? What if we all really bought into the values of Wiki University? Is there any more? Learning te what if learning technologists actually helped each other and maybe like picked one target per year and, and genuinely worked on it? Okay, I, I need to finish, but I think that's absolutely brilliant. So I, I really would like you to give yourselves and each other a very good clap as a start to follow that, that first one. So thank you. I believe that in the future, education will be valued quite differently. And even if each one of you took one of these ideas for me or yourselves today, we could actually start to transform the world of learning technologies quite quickly. Um, we could be at the forefront of the way education is construed, if you like, and bridge the you know bridge these gaps between the real and virtual worlds. It's nothing less than the change of the culture of knowledge. Now, how would, i leave you with the idea as, you, as we move on to Clive's talk about how will history judge your reign and your rule? Would your epitaph be, oh, those learning technologists, they stuck to the knitting, you know? Or, Will it be that they led the global community in building bridges to sharing knowledge and understanding in the 21st century? Within such dreams begins responsibility, which is the topic for next year's conference, which, as you heard, I'm co-chairing. So you have a year to report back, OK? So come to Manchester next year and let us know what you've had a go. I will promise to make sure there's space and time during next year's conference to hear about some of these achievements, okay? All right, so thank you very much, everyone, for listening.